probably thinks that uh, dogs have been brought back after chronic preservation, as I've heard uh, once. Um, uh, you know, the general public has no, uh, no real appreciation. Thank you, yes. Uh, there's no real appreciation of, of uh, chronics and its potential and what has happened in its history. Uh, it's the scientific community that uh, can be persuaded. And if the scientific community is persuaded, then, uh, then we will save millions of lives uh, uh, because chronics will be, uh, will be readily available and reliable uh, to, to millions of people. Uh, and so it really comes down to persuading the scientific community. And what's great about persuading the scientific community is that they, they can be convinced of just about anything with sufficient evidence. Uh, I, I've met some scientists recently that believe that two black holes uh, collided uh, 1.3 billion light years from here. Uh, that's insane. Uh, on anybody's measure, but they were convinced by uh, by evidence. Chronic well, Einstein believed that 100 years ago, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, so chronic is uh, is um, uh, not even nearly as radical as the stuff that the scientific community already uh, uh, already accepts. Uh, and so this just shows that, so I guess my answer to your question is absolutely, absolutely, uh, the SDS uh, blood-brain barrier opening technique that uh, was also crucial in this uh, should be followed extremely diligently, uh, uh, and another publication should come out that says, uh, you know, non-aldehyde-stabilized cryopreservation works just as well with an explanation point. Yes, I agree with that, 100%. Absolutely, absolutely. I've told Greg this. Actually, actually, I had conversations with Robert after he had become clear that aldehyde-stabilized car preservation was, uh, was working so well. Uh, I told him, uh, can you go back and do some of the experiments without the aldehydes now and see if that works because I'm going to have a really hard time explaining to people why they need aldehyde. <laughs> so I am, yeah. I am a, a big believer in following up on more research without the aldehyde. Well, I don't know why Robert isn't interested in that. And I, I didn't realize he wasn't until a couple of days ago. I, I didn't even know he'd left 21st century medicine, but apparently he's not interested in pursuing that path. Uh, and I don't know why, since I haven't spoken to him yet. Uh, conversations that I've had with Robert, uh, and he should speak for himself, obviously, but the conversations I've had with Robert uh, uh, has been, uh, he, he seemed like he was uh, interested in that. It's just a matter of priorities. Uh, you don't typically uh, get a very good scientific result in one area and then suddenly drop it and go on to uh, the next harder uh, method immediately. Uh, you try to uh, follow up uh, with um, uh, additional experiments. So, for instance, one of the things that he wants to show is that this works uh, to preserve the synaptic proteins as well. Okay, well, that's totally important. Well, I'm not really, I mean, I'm not objecting to him pursuing his pathway because I think if we have multiple people pursuing multiple pathways, that's a better approach. So if he's pursuing this approach, and Pluto Central Medicine, I'm told, is now pursuing the brain barrier opening technology further, that's excellent. So we're pursuing both of those approaches. Yeah. Uh, I, would like, uh, I would just comment, though, Ken, on, on your saying that you know, scientists could be convinced of uh, apparently very bizarre things by the evidence. Um, I think that that's, that's largely true, although it varies a lot depending on the area of science you're talking about. But it's also a little misleading, um, as I kind of interjected, that Einstein, you know, about 100 years ago, uh, recognized this kind of thing was possible with black holes. So it wasn't, it's not really very new in that sense. It was just waiting for some good evidence to come along. But it fit perfectly within the theoretical framework that was existing. But another, a big difference really is that black holes colliding, although it's kind of bizarre and impressive, doesn't really have anything to do with the human condition. And so people are much more willing to think about that kind of thing and to consider the possibilities. When it comes to matters of life and death, people, it doesn't matter how smart they are, what their PhDs are in, they can be incredibly irrational. 
and not want to face that and not want to think about it and be in denial and then want to be absolutely certain either that they are going to go to some kind of afterlife or that if they are not believers, they want to just settle back with the idea that they're going to be gone and that's it and not worry about it. This idea that there is some chance, an unknown chance that can't really be quantified very well, that terrifies people. So I've talked to numerous people who say, yeah, I think there's actually a pretty decent chance that this could work, but I hope it doesn't work. I'm, too, I'm terrified that it will work because I'll come back into this world where I'm obsolete and everything will be radically different. That is actually a vastly more powerful objection. So I think it's really the, the social pressure and it's kind of philosophical issues that are the biggest problem for accepting cryonics rather than the evidence. Although I don't disagree with this, you know, if the vast majority of neuroscientists came out and repeatedly said, you know, there is a technology that can make this work, that should eventually <laughs> create some kind of acceptance. But I think even those neuroscientists are going to have a strong, a strong resistance to coming to that conclusion, no matter what the evidence. I hope I'm shown to be wrong. So, so can I uh, can I ask you a question, Max? Yeah. Because uh, I'm 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 very curious. I, I'm. Uh, what is okay? So I. Obviously, I'm a big believer in the idea of chronics. Uh, I think it would be a tragedy. I think it's already a tragedy. I, I, I think we should be living in a world today where, uh, uh, where every hospital uh, offers people a highly reliable chronic service. Uh, that's, that's the type of world that I think we should be living in today. Um, uh, because we've certainly had enough time uh, since the uh, the invention of the idea to have perfected it, um, so given that, I think that you know, in let's say five or ten years, that should be the world that uh, that we are living in. Uh, what is your plan uh, to make that happen, or do you think it's in, in, impossible? No, I don't think it's impossible. I, 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 I think that will be the world, and I tell people this all the time when I talk about cryonics, because I think it's important to, uh, not just to present some kind of arguments as to why it will be possible, to present a scenario um, where it's already happened that's much more powerful. So I do, I try to describe a world in which, exactly as you're saying, every hospital in you know, civilized parts of the world, and hopefully the whole world, will have cryonics units, um, and they will do that ready to treat patients immediately and then transfer them later on to long-term storage with other organizations. And that, that'll be the norm. And people will look back on the current day and shake their heads and think, were well, these people insane? They took their loved ones and threw them in the ground to be eaten by worms and bacteria or threw them into giant ovens to be incinerated when they could have preserved them beautifully. Those people were insane. So I'm trying to get rid of that mindset. And yes, I think that will happen. Uh, when it will happen, I don't know. I don't think it's going to happen in five years. Um, I'd love to think that it would, but I think it's unlikely. Uh, what am I going to do? Well, I don't have a lot of resources, Ken. Uh, Cryonix has had no resources, essentially, for almost all its history. Alcor has now got to the stage where we have uh, income averaging around $2 million a year. Uh, that's not uh, surplus money that we can spend on research. We have probably a research budget that's maybe $75,000 a year. So I'm quite happy to support research in this area, what we're doing. And as you know, some of the members of Alcor who are both here are essentially supporting the research of 21st century medicine and elsewhere. So what I can do is to just keep supporting that kind of expenditure and to try to raise more funding um, from our wealthier members who could be doing a lot more than they are, should be doing a lot more than they are, to promote this research. Um, so that's what I can do on the research side because I'm not a researcher myself. On the other side, I can just keep trying to point to the evidence and give the arguments and address people's concerns, again, especially the philosophical ones, <coughs> and dystopian views about the future, which really do scare people. I mean, I've talked to hundreds and hundreds of people. I know this very well. Uh, it's the fear of being alone in, the, in, a, in a strange future. It's the fear that they'll come back into some kind of Terminator world or a world where their organs will be used for spare parts, which, of course, is the ludicrous idea. Uh, so I can keep addressing those kind of ideas um, and trying to contradict people like Michio Kaku who come out completely ignorantly <laughs> using the authority uh, based on the knowledge of other subjects to you know, talk absolute nonsense about cryonics. So I can do that and I can support the research to the extent that we have the resources and try to persuade our wealthier members to put money into that area. 
I mean, I, I, I have no argument um, uh, with, with, with everything you just said. I, I, I think there is a, uh, there is a possibility. Uh, I mean, this is the, um, uh, uh, so I'm not sure if I'm right about this, but I'm free to hold my own opinion. Uh, uh, I think there is a possibility that um, having uh, chronic services offered to human beings uh, today uh, and for decades past uh, has been actually detrimental uh, to the uh, to moving that cause to making that that future a reality. Uh, I could be wrong. I I freely admit that. Um, but uh, I, I look at it almost like uh, uh, it it's been given decades of a try. And it seems to have only pissed off the medical and scientific community if there was some plan uh, that could uh, reboot the, uh, the idea in the minds of the scientific and medical community, uh, then, and there was an agreement, this is a very hypothetical uh, uh, thing that I'm throwing out here, if there was a uh, a, uh, a peace talks uh, between um, uh, Alcor, uh, yourself, and um, uh, CI and whoever else is, uh, is offering human services, and uh, I don't know, the head of the NIH, uh, probably not a bad, um, not, a, not a good person to, to mention. But, uh, I have a comment. Uh, uh, well, just a second. Uh, if, if there was a meeting like that and, and they laid out a set of criteria uh, that would uh, let them accept completely uh, uh, rolling out chronics in hospitals, uh, I get the feeling that when you guys walked away from that table, there might be a moratorium uh, that was demanded, but within a few years, you would hit all of their criteria and we would be in a much better world. Uh, yeah, yes, Natasha? Uh, yes, I, I can. I, I think this is good, and I, I think that uh, it's already in the process as an ad adjacent to chronics. Uh, the Transhumanist Council with uh, legislation and policy making, we're looking at rights of people uh, in regards to morphological freedom, for radical life extension, these different areas, because there are no policies, legislation, rules, or laws that um, adhere to the current state of advances in science and technology and people's awareness of saying. But let me step back just a few um, moments. When you uh, said that it, um, that there, the alarmists concern or the alarm, uh, the ringing concern is that uh, over the those who have been uh, put in chronics uh, up to this point and during this current time frame um, it's questionable about the efficacy of that the integrity of it etc I here I have um, an issue with this because if we look over time we could say the same about uh, astronauts going to space we could say the same about uh, individuals early on going across the seas, whether it's the Vikings or um, the uh, later um, pioneers for religious freedom, they had no idea where they were really going, um, maybe a little bit, but if you go further back in time, those who soared ahead as explorers and looking for new lands and new ways of life did not have a written um, procedure, did not have policies in place, did not have legislation, did not have a group of, uh, of scientists or um, explorers or um, geologists, geographists, etc., telling them what was right and what was wrong. And certainly they were going out on a limb there because it was what they wanted to do. And you um, said that in your view and your right to give a, a voice to your personal opinions, uh, that is what we need more of. However, you, this is beyond that at this point. You're making an assumption about how people should or should not behave and stripping humanity of one of its most valued assets, which is the ability to explore, to problem solve, to innovate, to come up with 
alternative realities, alternative uh, to the, uh, the current state of things, is what we strive for. So the pioneers of Quranics are those who are in the uh, doers and those who are signed up, and they are fully aware that they may not uh, be revived in whole or in part, but it is their commitment to this future that uh, they or we truly believe in will happen. And if I can go in as a, perhaps a, a person that may not be brought back, I would rather go in and have my body and my brain uh, donated to this future cause, just as a person has his or her body uh, donated to scientific research. So I think that while what you're saying I agree with, in part, it's a bit um, far-fetched in assumptions about uh, control over a person's uh, ability to create, invent, and explore. Uh, yeah, well, I can't, uh, uh, I can't argue with you there. I, I think there's probably uh, counterexamples of, um, uh, of some medical, uh, let's say, uh, some medical therapy uh, that uh, had an enormous amount of, uh, of uh, promise, uh, let's say gene therapy, uh, that uh, had a few uh, uh, premature uh, uh, tests that uh, were perceived as going very wrong and that uh, slows down the entire field. Um, this is a, uh, these are social questions. These shouldn't be scientific questions. Uh, the scientific community shouldn't really care. Uh, if, uh, uh, should care. Uh, this is, uh, psychology is science. People's behaviors is a science. The field of, of understanding what influences people. And that's where chronics and any type of future uh, technology or science that intervenes with what's what we call the human condition ought to have this as, as a strong part of it. And this brings up again the, the issue of morphological freedom. So I, I think that that it is valuable and, and important to have these different uh, aspects discovered and, and voiced, but it adding a voice as a, an important aspect of the entire grasp of research, but not to infringe on pe a person's choice, but I think it should be made available. And perhaps there's a, a strong element here that needs to be pushed into this, this new organization of legislation. It's under the uh, auspices of the transhumanist uh, policy making. Absolutely not what um, Mr. Espan calls his Party. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the more rigorous scholarship in looking at uh, politics and legislation. I'm sorry. If I can interrupt one moment, I'd like to rely a question from Randall Kuhn on Facebook. Uh, yes. And I'm still uh, finding out how to use all these things because I see something on my iPad which is not the same thing that I see on the Facebook page. Okay, I will learn that. So, Randall said that he's wondering what cryo Rus opinion will be about the uh, possibility to create a hospital procedure based on uh, ASC, uh, which is interesting because uh, they operate in a completely different regulatory environment. So, I think I'm kind of seeing what he means, and uh, that's the same comment that I was making to Ken uh, before uh, the meeting started. Is that we could have at the same time uh, something done scientifically by players in the United States with all the rigorous scientific approach which is typical of clinical trials in medicine and we could also have something maybe less scientifically sound much more adventurous but at the same time already suitable for uh, human uh, patients than somewhere else uh, in the world. I guess uh, that's the point Randall wants to get at. And uh, I'd like to get uh, some opinions about that now or later. Okay, well, I could comment on that. Um, as far as I understood the question, uh, right now, 
I guess the question is motivated by the idea that in Russia there's no real regulation of this and so you can do what you want. I don't know if that's true, actually. I don't know what the situation is there exactly. Um, but I can say that it, in the United States, uh, alcohol and other clients organizations currently operate under the UAGA, the Uniform Anatomical Gift Act, which actually gives us legal authority to take possession of what are considered biological remains that will be considered to be patients. And that's all perfectly legal for us to do. There is no, at least in this country, of course, things are supposed to be legal unless there's explicitly a law against them. That's a little bit of a difference to some other countries. So there's really nothing to prevent us, and we actually have a legal mechanism by which we can accept patients. And uh, in the eyes of the law, we own those biologically, uh, those donated biological samples. Now, there's a further step, though, in terms of, of uh, legal ability to do this. And I've been talking to Jordan Sparks at Oregon Cryonics, and you know, we're actually a very cooperative relationship with each other right now. And he's basically said that because of the laws in Oregon that allow uh, something like assisted suicide, uh, there may be certain cases where alcohol members may want to go to Portland and take advantage of those laws. And he would be willing to basically help people get residents, uh, which you know, we're still trying to decide whether it's as easy as he thinks it is or not, but it is, it is possible and um, work out procedures we could do there and then transport alcohol. So that would be a place where, for instance, here's an example where I see that being especially useful. In most of our cases, it just makes sense for people to come to Scottsdale, if they, they know their terminal, to check into the local hospice and they're just minutes away. But what if you have a condition that is freshly destroying your brain, or will do so very soon, then it might make more sense actually to go to somewhere like Oregon, where you can, if you get two doctors to agree, you have less than six months, um, and you're able to self-administer, because you have to better do it yourself, um, then you could choose what time to check out, and you'd have your team standing by with no delay. That's a very good situation. So I think there are quite a few possibilities in this country, and we're seeing this kind of legislation spreading in now four or five states, I think currently five states, that have uh, assisted suicide or death for dignity laws, and I'd like to see those further expanded. I think it for instance, should not be necessary to self-administer, and what if you've got ALS or you're paralyzed, then you're kind of screwed, so we need to change those laws. Um, so there's a lot that can be done, actually, in the United States and probably in some European countries. Um, we actually have someone looking at those on a case-by-case -case basis, because the laws do vary considerably. So you don't necessarily have to go to Russia, which has other downsides. <laughs> um, it can be done over here to a large degree. And, and just maybe, maybe in Switzerland as well. Yeah, because one thing is the great distances, but that, that may not be a big problem if we can do uh, remote vitrification, remote cryoprotection. That's really the crucial thing. We're not going to ship people back on water ice without kind of a long delay. That's why we've really made big advances in recent years in being able to do field vitrification. We did that even in Thailand and China uh, last year, something that's never been done before. So if we could do that, if we could uh, actually do the whole way down to dry ice you know, with cryoprotection in Europe, uh, that would certainly be a possibility. Um, I'm not sure how much better it is in Switzerland. I'd have to check exactly what the legislation says there. But I, I do think it's much harder to get citizenship in Switzerland than it is to get residency in, uh, in Oregon. So that would be more difficult. <coughs> yeah, I can uh, uh, say that it's very difficult to get citizenship oh, in Switzerland because there is a top tourism. Um, uh, what is tourism over the border going on there? Okay, well, yeah, we'll have to look into that a little bit more. Uh, I haven't read any specific requests for that, but I don't know more about that. Um, but just to add one further point, uh, well, I, I, I certainly agree with Ken that we want to see acceptance of this idea, you know, at least the idea in principle, and hopefully the idea in practice um, by neuroscientists. Neuroscientists aren't the only people who matter here. Um, the people we deal with in every day, actually, in doing cryonics are hospital administrators and risk management people and doctors and nurses, everybody in the medical establishment. And you know, 20, 30 years ago, those people didn't want it to see us. They didn't want to touch us. They wouldn't let us in the hospitals. They were not cooperative. That has really changed drastically. So I, I don't think people should have the impression that things aren't changing because they are. Our typical reaction now, you know, in the past it was get out of my hospital. Today it's Oh, I've seen this on the Discovery Channel, or I've read about this in Scientific American. This is interesting. Can we watch? Can we help you in some way? That is the typical reaction today, which is drastically different. Um, you know, that's allowed us to have a very cooperative relationship with a, a hospital here in Scottsdale. It has the hospice working uh, internally with them, and it enables a very smooth transition. 
So I think even before we've got clinical trials and neuroscientist acceptance and uh, uh, all these other things which would be lovely to have, that doesn't mean that we can't proceed. So that really comes back to the issue of whether what we're doing right now is ethical or not. And I really object to this characterization of what we're doing as being a kind of cowboy unethical uh, practices because you know, we're showing what the level of evidence is. We're saying there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty, but people in the meantime are dying, and this is something we can do. Now, Ken, you might be right that if clinics hadn't existed for the last 40, 45 years, that we'd be in a better starting position. I think in some ways that's probably true because of like, the Chatsworth disaster and various other bad things that have happened. Um, but we can't rewrite history. We have to start from where we are, and you can't blame people for <laughs> trying to stay alive by whatever means they have. Uh, but I don't see... Uh, sorry, uh, do you believe that cryonics is a much better or a, a faster way to increase uh, lifespan rather than implanting or transferring minds into other bodies like, uh, um, I don't know, CRISPR, if you know the kind of uh, project they are making now? Well, CRISPR is not going to let you transfer your mind into another body. It's just going to let you edit some genes. There is no other method right now. There is no way of uploading right now. And just to be clear, there, it, it's not a choice of cryonics or uploading. Um, if cryonics works, then in the future when we have revival technology, it could be that you could be revived biologically, or especially if you said in your paperwork that you don't have a problem with this philosophically, um, you can say, I'd rather be uploaded. So it's not either or. You can have both. Uh, one way of being uploaded is to be cryopreserved, because that's the only way you're going to get to a future where you can be sufficiently scanned and uploaded. Um, but I have to also just point out that a lot of people, I don't know if it's a majority, but it's a large number of people, just don't accept philosophically the idea that an uploaded version of them is them. And personally, I don't yeah, have yeah. a problem with that. But a lot of people do, so that wouldn't even be an option for them in terms of survival. Some sort of a representation, a, a Baudrillardian kind of uh, hyper reality, uh, an avatar um, which remains an avatar, a copy without an original. Um, what I'm saying is that is cryonics closer to us with this uh, achievement than anything else out there which expands life? Yes, absolutely. There's no other way. I mean, the, the fact is that we today cannot extend the maximum human lifespan. Nobody has lived longer than 122 years, unless you can. Our patient James Bedford, who's uh, actually surpassed that, if you can, him is at least not dead. But the fact is we can't extend the maximum human lifespan today. There is no um, proven method of doing that uh, other than marginally. So there's no way of uploading somebody today. What we can do is cryopreserve somebody and... If uploading is the preference of that individual, at least that then gives them a possible way of getting to a future where they could be uploaded. But there's no other way of, of having survival beyond you know, when your body gives out on you today. Do you agree, Ken? Uh, yes, I, well, I absolutely agree that Cranix is, uh, uh, is essentially the most logical step that people have today for, um, uh, for trying to survive. Uh, it, uh, life extension technologies uh, are great to, uh, to research, but I think that they could take decades and decades and decades, and that will uh, mean millions of people that die that would not have to die if there was a perfected chronics. I, I think there is a... Um, uh, I, I am uncomfortable with the... Uh, with the discussion of of uh, cryonics as potentially giving rise to the ability to to bring somebody back biologically, uh, I I see this as a um, as a little bit of a uh, it, it's almost a, uh, a difference in terms. Uh, there is there is no way that we can think of today to bring somebody back that has been chronically preserved, and so the methods that we can imagine are essentially rebuilding the person, either by nanotechnology or some other means, 
rebuilding the person uh, from the uh, the stuff that is preserved. Uh, Sorry, and um... so there's there's a a little bit of a distinction between uh, you know chromatics that could that if it didn't have aldehydes in it would uh, would allow for biological revival, but chronics that uh, has aldehydes only leads to mind uploading. Uh, I, I think somebody in the comments mentioned earlier, well, what about uh, Drexler's uh, wonderful discussion in, uh, in his book on, uh, on reversing aldehyde uh, and vitrification using uh, nanotechnology? Uh, absolutely. I think that that's, um, that's something to, uh, 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 to note. And, and it makes little difference uh, whether there's aldehydes in there or not from a conceptual point of view, depending upon how much damage is, uh, is really um, uh, happening to a chronically preserved brain. Well, I'm not, Ken, I'm not sure if you're saying, you're saying they have to totally rebuild a person. I'm not sure if you're saying essentially there's no biological continuity. If you're saying that, I, I would disagree. I mean, looking at the kind of thing that Trex has proposed, that Robert Friedis has written two very large volumes on, you would be standing with quite a lot and doing some you know, substantial repair, but uh, if, this is, if this is actually preserving the structures pretty well, you're going to keep most of the additional material. Uh, to me, that, that actually isn't relevant. You could completely make a new copy as far as I'm concerned. But for those people who do believe in bodily continuity, I, I think you would be keeping most of the original substance. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, th I think we're on the same wavelength. I, I, I think that it does keep much more of the stuff uh, and it is irrelevant that it does. Right. Although, uh, so, so to the extent that, yeah. Yeah, let me just quick see Laurie, uh, Laurie Rose mentioning a point here and Linda. Um, that there is something else, of course, you can do. Uh, the original question was, is cryonics the, the only way or the best way? Uh, it's not exclusive of some other approaches. This, the idea of you know, mind files and backing up your personal information, which is something obviously that's growing in popularity with all these you know, life logging and tracking devices and much greater capabilities for capturing your personal experience. I think that is very complementary to cryonics. Uh, it could have, you know, if you had a certain amount of damage, and um, there's no doubt that some of our patients are, are badly damaged. If you have a cerebral hemorrhage before you're quite preserved, that's very bad news. If you have Alzheimer's and so on. So if you had these mind files, uh, you might be able to interpolate and recreate a lot of what was there from the remaining clues. So in that sense, I don't think it's exclusive um, of the mind files approach. And, and I think that's something that I would like to see Alcohol be able to do more with, and I'm happy to, you know, work with... Um, Martin and other people who are interested in this area. So it would just be another way of repairing the damage, essentially, by using what clues are left behind. Can I, can I ask something? Um, I was wondering, when, when it comes to file transfer, let's say mind information transfer, wouldn't it be there a problem with uh, surveillance or the preservation of private information which constitutes our individuality as opposed to cryonics, which is something, as I imagine it, I don't know how it, it works exactly, but it doesn't, it, it looks safer than the, cryonics looks safer, a safer choice than uh, this mind kind of, uh, although you said there is no end, or there is no or in between these two ways, I'm just interested in uh, a, a uh, private properties and surveillance uh, when it comes to well, that's a real issue. I mean, I was at uh, the Biohackers Conference in Finland a few months ago, and uh, there's a fellow, uh, a Scottish researcher, I forget his name right now, but he is, you know, he's one of the people on the extreme end of the self-surveillance spectrum. He essentially is recording, he has a camera going all the time, and he has, you know, terabytes of, of data. So, you know, that question comes up, and I had to ask him, you know, has that changed your behavior? Uh, knowing that this is being recorded and someone could access this. And we had an interesting discussion about that, and he talked about, you know, there are ways of protecting people's privacy by using certain algorithms. For instance, if you're recording everything you see, other people may be pretty unhappy with that. So you can, it's actually not too hard to put in something that recognizes faces and blurs them out. But it might be harder to uh, do that for yourself if the whole objective is to capture as much information as possible. So, yes, I, I kind of agree that... If you're going to use mind files, you have to acknowledge that you can't rule out the possibility that somebody else will be able to review those and see 
you know, all the naughty things that you've done, <laughs> uh, or potentially embarrassing things. Um, so that's just going to be a choice you have to make. I and mean, you have to decide how much you want to edit those files and what you want to leave out. In fact, that raises some interesting uh, issues that have actually have been dealt with in science fiction and in the literature, not in, in movies so much. Exactly. Um, it would be deliberate editing of memories. Maybe you want to yeah, deliberately um, edit your past to create a new, slightly different future self. Yeah, because I come from a background of literature and science fiction right now. That's how I view this. I view this from a kind of, um, uh, not say romantic, but an early phase uh, kind of um, mind-preserving uh, identity uh, level. Um, uh, obviously, you are you are actually in practice. Well, and the neuroscientist. Well, what um, are you? I'm talking to whom right now? Um, it interests me from a, a literature kind of perspective as well. I mean, right now you're saying, hey, what are you talking about? Well, here we're talking about something real, something uh, tangible, something that uh, exists right now. Uh, Crowdiness. Um, well, what would you say to all that? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what exactly to respond to, other than, again, that I think, apart from recognizing that there are trade offs to storing all your personal information, uh, I do think there are some interesting possibilities in editing that information. Um, I'm personally not interested in doing that. I want to keep everything that I've ever experienced, no matter how horrible it is. I've had some pretty horrible experiences in my life. I want to keep all of that, but I do understand that some people may choose not to. Um, you can think of cases like Holocaust survivors, for instance. Uh, some of those have said that you know, if they could, they would like to just wipe out those memories. And in fact, you know, there's now some evidence that it might be possible to selectively destroy uh, certain memories. Um, that's actually been shown experimentally. That would be so something that people would have to decide. I mean, it's, it's their information, it's their personality. It should be up to them to choose that, I think, with some expert guidance, because you might have some repercussions that, that you may not realize. But it might be, you know, you have some traumatic event that caused you to be anxious or depressed or paranoid. And perhaps it might not be so bad to remove that for some people. I'm what not sure if that answers your question. The problem is that uh, here we're talking about a selection of memories which, as you said, might be uh, causing other uh, kind of psychological uh, issues. But the, the whole thing about the brain is not its conscious uh, material. There is an, about uh, how much percent, 80, 90 percent of the, our beings, our identities being... Um, uh, being automatized by our unconscious uh, desires, by the unconscious material that is located uh, in the unconscious. So uh, we're talking about a selection. In fact, there is no such a thing as selection. It's what um, what we think. It's it's an illusion. This conscious um, conscious idea of I'm doing this right now, I'm being with you right now, I'm unaffected by what you're hearing. Um, at the same time, there is this unconscious part of me which I cannot control, which has obviously impacted on this conversation. And, and I don't know how it, it could. So the brain, the, the whole idea with the brain doesn't have to do with consciousness, it has to do also with the unconscious. Yeah, as far as I, I understand the point, I agree with that. I think a lot of what we do is not generated by the conscious mind or conscious decisions. In fact, I think that's been shown pretty well experimentally that we don't really know why we do <laughs> what we're doing a lot of the time. We kind of confabulate, we make up reasons for our actions afterwards. Um, there's even some suggestion that, uh, I think it was Leibniz's research, that we've already made the decision and then you become aware of it afterwards. So a lot of what we do seems to be driven by the unconscious today. Um, and it's kind of interesting because people like to talk about how humans are uniquely conscious and self-aware, but actually we're really not. We're not very conscious at all. I think it's quite possible in the future with a bit of redesign of the mind, we might be a lot more aware if we choose to be of what's going on with the machinery deep down. I mean, we really don't have a clue what generates our emotions. We can't just 
change our emotions. It's no, no good saying, don't worry, be happy. That just doesn't work. <laughs> you can't tell a depressed person, just, just be happy. Because they don't have that kind of control. There are no pathways going from the cognitive centers to the emotional centers that make that possible. So, yeah, I agree that um, a huge amount of what we are is in the subconscious and it's not even consciously accessible necessarily. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's, the irony. Being it's, the, it's the whole irony of the whole situation that we're talking about uh, uh, transhumanism or extending uh, human capabilities for the meaning that we do not know exactly how the brain in particular, which is, let's say, the, the, the whole control center of our being, we do not know how it even works. So that's a very problematic aspect for me. I don't and know about that. I'd like to interject first. You, you bring up, thank you, sorry, you bring up a really important part about um, this discussion here in, in relation to uh, human enhancement and this whole scope could be seen under the, the, the auspices of human enhancement because that's basically what it is, right? So when you say if we don't even understand the brain, its functionality, its uh, biochemical system, the um, deep-rooted psychology and peripheral psychology, um, then the question then becomes, we're manipulating it and steering it and, and professing to direct it and organize it and save it and copy it without even knowing it. But if you look at human enhancement, that is, it's, it's not a new transhumanist notion. Human enhancement has, has been around for a very long time, and, and of course that's a given, and, and you are a scholar, so you know that. But when we're talking about transhumanist human enhancement, it is far outside the realms of, of uh, transhumanism and has looked at a, a larger sphere of extropy. Uh, the most enhanced people today are those who have prosthetic parts who have prosthetic arms or legs or augmentations to their cognitive properties. These are individuals who are enhanced beyond basic human biological capabilities, and they seem to be doing very well. And it's an amazing um, process for these people to have robotic, narrow AI-driven enhancements to help them. So I think that if we look at that section of society as the purveyors of human enhancement, then it does make uh, more sense as far as what is possible within the realms of current day transhumanists as far as human enhancement. in the main chat window? I see, yes. okay, I see uh, question four. Questions. Okay. Uh, I don't see question one, two, and three. Uh, I can read this aloud. Maybe that, that would be uh, more reasonable. So question one. Uh, do you see problems with scaling up the human brain volume? I see you've uh, used pics as well. Uh, which are a little bit smaller. So, so first of all, I want to uh, make make very clear that I have not done any of this uh, research uh, except for doing electron microscopy on it. Uh, uh, Robert McIntyre is the main person that has uh, has done this research along with uh, Greg Fahey and the great people at 21st Century Medicine. Um, uh, According to their paper and according to the physics of what is occurring, all of this is being done by perfusion, and so there is no problem whatsoever in scaling this up to a human, to a whale, uh, whatever. <laughs> okay, that's good enough. Uh, a second question, maybe it's all out of scope, maybe I should just ask Greg. Uh, uh, can is this fixation cryopreservation still works best when initiated a live animal, not per arrest truck, correct? Uh, so that is a, a fantastic question that I am definitely not qualified to answer. Uh, the, 
there have been, and the main reason is I've gotten conflicting answers from people that uh, I trust should know. <laughs> so, uh, so for instance, in a in a uh, in a laboratory situation, uh, we it makes a tremendous amount of, from all the laboratories that I've been. It makes a tremendous amount of difference uh, uh, when you do the perfusion if you do it on a live animal or not. Uh, but I've heard uh, discussions from Mike Darwin and others. I'm sure Max could uh, um, uh, add to this. Uh, that if the right techniques are are used, the right drugs, the right uh, pressures, that you can uh, reopen a vascular system and allow good access even after some amount of of, uh, of ischemic uh, injury after death. Uh, I really don't know the right answer to that. Uh, I would love to see uh, some really good. Uh, a, a really good scientific paper that addresses this, and it was my understanding that um, that there have been people uh, that have been interested in doing exactly that type of uh, uh, scientific experiment on uh, different time lengths uh, of ischemia. Uh, certainly, they've shown up in the in the chronics online literature before, uh, but. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I mean there are there are there are experiments, but I can't point to a scientific paper that that nails it. Uh, I, I read the answer there, but I didn't actually hear the question very well, so I'm trying to interpret, interpret it from what you were saying, Ken. Was the question about uh, recoverability from various time uh, time exposures of ischemia? Ischemia was it? I'm not sure yes. what the question was. Yes, okay. exactly. Well, yeah, there is research being done by that. Um, actually, a lot of it's currently been done by Advanced Neurobiosciences in Portland, where they are actually doing exactly that, testing different periods of ischemia. And, is this yeah, Ashwin and DeWolf? And yeah, Ashwin and China and others okay. up there uh, doing that kind of research. And yeah, I like them actually published in some scientific journals, but they've, they have published that privately and it will probably be appearing more in Climax magazine. But there are ways of alleviating that damage. Um, I mean, it's definitely preferable to have no ischemic time, but uh, there's no doubt that you can actually have quite considerable periods of ischemia and with the right with the right protection, you can um, still have a very good perfusion. And we can also see that on our end, in that what Alcor has been doing for the last three or four years and hasn't ever been done before, and this is part of the evidence by the way, Ken, that we can be presenting to people, is uh, our CT scan studies. Now, these don't show the kind of structural preservation you get from electron microscope studies, but they're still quite useful in that you can show how well a brain has been perfused. And you can also then compare that to the ischemic time. Um, we're still really in the early stages of that. We're, I think we've CT scanned about 15 patients right now. And initially, uh, the board was uh, putting the brakes on that, but we had plan to scan all of our neuro patients, and it may be possible to do some whole body patients. And that's showing us quite a lot about um, ischemic delays, the kind of treatment that people got, the condition that uh, stopped the body's functioning, and how well we perfuse the brain. And we do see vast differences. We see some extremely good cases, we see some poor cases. Um, so there's a lot more work that needs to be done in that area, both in on the side of the, you know, experimentation as to what kind of chemical cocktails we can use, what kind of pressures we can use, um, and also in terms of you know, what's actually happening under current conditions with different periods of ischemia. But certainly the, the idea that you know the brain dies after three or four minutes without oxygen, that, that has to go, <laughs> along with the idea that, uh, uh, that cells explode from the inside by rapidly expanding ice. We've got to get rid of these two ideas. Yes, absolutely. Uh, third question, which is the leading and do this. How badly did the 15 minutes ischemic peaks in terms of structural preservation? Because they are mentioned in the paper, but I don't think they have been uh, used in it. Do you know? Have you talked to Greg about it? Uh, so I, I have talked to Robert about that, um, and I, uh, I can't say anything concrete. Okay. Well, we know that there are people who have been clinically dead for several hours, you know, who've been fairly rapidly chilled, although less rapidly than when we use our procedures, and, you know, they're hard to stop beating, so they're not pumping anything around, they're essentially ischemic, and yet they've been steaming for hours and have been recovered either completely intact or very close to completely intact. Um, and that's without any kind of treatment, that's without any, any of the 16 chemicals that we typically use. Uh, so. 
Yeah, ischemia is certainly a problem, but uh, it seems pretty clear that moderate amounts of ischemia are not a big an issue. It's not, it's not immediately going to be destroying the structures. Um, next, my question was specific to, um, to this um, fixation, cryopreservation approach. So I was just trying to uh, figure okay, out sorry. how badly it's, it's going to, to do to it. Okay, and I have one question, which is just technical. Uh, I think you, you've used uh, different grades of glutar aldehyde. Have you tried freshly distilled glutar aldehyde? Uh, so the the paper of Robert and uh, and Greg's uh, uh, mentioned that they used uh, uh, scientific quality grade, and then they went to a lesser grade, and it didn't make a difference. Uh, that's that's all the information that I have on that. Okay, then. I'll also take the uh, I, I, the, uh, the, the, if I remember correctly, and I could be misremembering this, that there is some, uh, uh, there is, the, the issue is whether a, there's some polymerization of the aldehydes uh, prior to fixation. Yes. Uh, so, yes. that's, that's really the, uh, uh, in all the electron microscopy books, they say make up everything very fresh, uh, because it really does make a difference. Okay, thanks. Can I ask something about the ethical issues, which is something that um, has been bothering me about cryogenics? In general, I'm sorry, I can't uh, hear? About cryogenics and uh, human enhancement in general. Um, what about this idea of choosing not to be in the category of those who, let's say, want to get into this procedure? And uh, wouldn't there be a division between those who want to and those who don't want to, and thereby a difference in what human being really is? I mean, a confusion and division. Uh, is, is it something that... Uh, do you believe that the government, and as if it's achieved, if, when it's going to be achieved, should uh, take measures as to um, treating it like a, a eugenics program, uh, whereby everyone in the population should get into this process, or should it just la leave it open to uh, people, uh, for people to choose? whether to do it or not, because there is a problem there, as I've said, that there will be a, a huge division of the other population, and I believe that uh, due to other religious views or, um, or fear of technology, let's say, so what the, the idea of human being will be um, subs substantially changed. Uh, what do you think on that? I think the best person to answer this is probably Matt, since he wrote The Philosophy of Transhumanism. But as chair of Humanity Plus, that is our, our aim. That's what we, we work at in our nonprofit organization, which is the leading organization for transhumanist views. And also in the arena of um, uh, David Kelly, who's building the uh, Policy Center for Legislation and looking at rules and regulations. Uh, here I, I will defer to Max in his authoring two in, uh, important components of, to answer your question, one is morphological freedom, which I mentioned earlier today, and the other one is the proactionary principle. Uh, Max, do you want to talk on it or would you prefer I? Yeah, I, I think uh, morphological freedom is a critical principle and um, that's why I wanted to get that out there because this idea of um, some kind of government enforced eugenics is very disturbing to me. It does not have a good history, it's not very encouraging, and I'm very against that. Um, I don't have a problem with eugenics in general. The word has gotten a bad rap because it's been associated with one form of eugenics, which is compulsory eugenics. But there are different ways. It really just means good genes, uh, so you can't really be against that. But it, yes, it has to be an individual choice. Nobody can be compelled to, to do these things, and that's why um, I felt the need for something like the principle of morphological freedom to make that very clear. And that's because transhumanism means different things to different people. And it has, I like to kind of really simplify it to two different ways of looking at it. You can think of it as transhumanism, or you can think of it as, as transhumanism. Now, if you think of it as transhumanism, the emphasis is on overcoming human limits, becoming better than human. That doesn't really tell you anything about the ethics or about choice. 
whereas transhumanism, which is, is root after all, it comes from the humanistic roots, uh, it much more points in the direction of individual choice. And I think we have to make that very clear. Um, there may be people who call themselves transhumanists who do want to enforce this on everybody. I don't know many such people. But we have to make that very, very clear. I really don't want the government to be in control of these technologies or these choices. Just as I don't think the government should compel the Amish to um, uh, use telephones or uh, uh, any kind of technology they don't wish to use. People should be free to form their own communities with their own chosen level of technology. And I'm sure there will be different communities where people do restrict the use of certain technologies and have agreed upon protocols. Mm -hmm. There may be yeah. some complicated issues where they come together and have to interact, but you know, we're just going to have to figure that stuff out. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, I, I was reading a dissertation uh, on uh, transhumanism, and uh, there was a part when um, when it, when it said, uh, "Let me um, let me remember um, that." Um, what about? the issue of, of the rich, right, of the rich having the ability to uh, use such technologies, whereas uh, a population which is poorer, let's say, or of lesser means would not be able to do that. So, as Stephen Hawking would say, that there would be a large division um, also socially. Uh, if we have uh, class differences nowadays, then um, with this kind of um, uh, affordability of choice to do, a, to do it or not to do it, if you want to, I mean, there will be inevitably uh, a, a short class divide bigger than now. Uh, what do you think? I think that same argument could have been made for many, many things in the past, and if we'd allowed that to stop us moving ahead, we'd never have gotten anywhere. Because so the people who use fire, you know, have an advantage over other people. People who can have automobiles that are too expensive right now shouldn't be allowed to have them. Uh, I mean, so on and so on. Um, so mobile that, phones. Uh, but now everybody has mobile phones. So I think yeah, what we I have to recognize. Okay, let me just let me just finish. I think what we have to recognize is that things, new technologies, often not always, but often are expensive to begin with and will tend to be uh, enjoyed by wealthy people but that they tend to come down in price more rapidly, and they wouldn't exist in the first place unless those wealthy people have been able to afford the rather early clunky models. Um, it really doesn't work to say, well, you can't allow this technology unless everybody can have it right now. That's just not the way things work. Um, I think that, uh, although I wouldn't personally advocate this, you could argue that uh, um, governments, and this starts getting into the area of governments, which I, I don't feel comfortable with, but uh, you could say governments could subsidize certain technologies that might give people a big advantage. Um, so, but, you know, I don't think this is a good argument for saying nobody should have a certain technology, a certain enhancement, unless everybody can have it today. Um, it looks to me that in, in general, and this is very much a generalization, the period between the first people getting a technology and most people having access to it seems to be getting shorter and shorter. Um, now, whether that's true of certain future enhancements really, really depends a lot on what they are and uh, as we seem to be miniaturizing things and mass-producing things, that seems to be you know, quite hopeful that that will be the situation. So I don't think it's going to be a big problem. There won't be this sudden class division. There may be you know, periods where certain technologies come online and some people have an advantage temporarily, but I don't, that's not going to last. Um, I think the alternative of just preventing them completely is just not tenable or desirable. Um, and to be honest, uh, I'm, I live in a country where it is uh, very, let's say, um, massively attacked by economic crisis. And uh, there is no middle class anymore. Uh, there is only rich people and a very, a very let's say, hard-working uh, uh, working class. As, uh, let me put it like that way. So um, I don't believe that with economic crisis that exists and which uh, with all these um, um, plans that the IMF is giving to countries like us um, is something that is going to uh, resolve uh, the division. And as I've said, if the division as it is right now, which will take years for us to repay the debt, 
doesn't make things better than the, the, the issue of transhumanism being, um, uh, uh, let's say, a privilege of the rich is something that uh, will be for a very long time and it will be eventually a problem. That's why I mentioned earlier, yes, I don't agree with eugenics in the sense that, okay, let's um, enforce that to the people and I don't want to get into that, but if the government uh, takes hold of that and allows people to get into such a program of transhumanism, then uh, I think it would be much fairer and it would uh, ameliorate um, these inequalities that, that would inevitably, and I believe that you would agree with that, uh, especially with the economic crisis uh, that exists now and it won't leave. It's something that, especially in, in Europe, it will stay for a very long time. I am going to be uh, intensive of this, on this issue. Um, I believe it should be, in, in, a, in a certain sense, part of uh, a governmentally controlled uh, area and not a too, you know, uh, private sectorized, um, you know, issue. What, what's your opinion? Uh, my opinion is I don't want people like Donald Trump deciding who gets an announcement and who doesn't. <laughs> so, in other words, I disagree. I think government should stay out of it. Uh, the only role governments have really is in setting rules uh, for informed consent, for instance, and general rules like that that allow people to make good decisions. Other than that, I think they should stay out of it. Uh, I, can, I have certain sympathy for the view that governments could be involved in the sense that they could provide some subsidies for people to afford this, like a, a negative income tax or like a voucher system has been proposed for education. Um, that would not mean they would control any of the details of what kind of enhancements you took. It would just be some you know, a voucher available to help pay for that. But you know, that's not really going to help very much if, as you say, you're in a country where the government has managed to really do a lot of damage to the economy and has caused this um, division of wealth. Um, you know, that's a problem in certain in certain countries around the world, much more than here in the U.S., I think. Uh, if, you're, if the country is not growing, and there are many countries that are still poorer than they were back in 2008 in Europe, if the country is not growing, it's very really hard for the government to afford things like that. So those kind of interdependent issues. Let me interject here and ask a question. Is there an assumption that uh, transhumanists or transhumanists are wealthy? Why not? Dan, I, d I didn't hear you, I'm sorry. Uh, why, uh, I agree with you that there is a very valid question that at, at a certain phase, I believe that um, Max said it at first, that it, it is a privilege of the rich at, at first, but then um, this is ameliorated because more and more people like uh, telephones, like uh, mobile phones, have the ability to, in a very short time, to buy them. Uh, I don't yeah, know. Yes, understood. But you. But my question is, when you say um, you use transhumanism in a way that um, appears, maybe I'm incorrect here, and correct me if I am, please. But from your use of it, it's almost as if you use it as a sine non or a matter of fact that transhumanism is for the elite or the wealthy and that it is the elite or the wealthy transhumanists who will have this. And then my, my question is, is it your understanding that transhumanists are wealthy? Um, to be honest, um, especially when, I, what, when it comes to my country, and as I see technology being used in my country, uh, the only way uh, a person, for example, can add a prosthetic limb, which is the least uh, transhumanist, uh, let's say, um, achievement, an early, sorry, an early transhumanist achievement, um, uh, then yes, it's not my idea that it is an elitist, transhumanist, uh, transhumanism is an elitist uh, conception meant to uh, make, let's say, um, a class distinction and uh, divide the world even further in terms of class um, or races for that matter because uh, from what I understand southern Europe is definitely uh, more uh, is poorer than 